Welcome to this service from the Church of Ireland, St. Nicholas in Adair, County Limerick, with the churches of Croom, Kilpeacon and Kilmallock. We like to form a pattern of the world, a mental map of how things work, why they happen, an explanation of the way the world works and why. We tend to seek explanations for new things, according to the old ways. Generally, it can serve us well. It makes our world feel more constant, more predictable, less random and unstable. It also cuts down on mental processing time. We can assume certain constants and concentrate on what is changing before our eyes. But sometimes it can serve us ill as we get overly used to expecting the expected, to anticipate the accustomed. Whereas at the Transfiguration we can contemplate total and radical change, of a change in one's very being, a change from the mundane to the extraordinary, from the everyday to the sacred. And so we start our service. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. God of creation, shaper of seas and stars, of planets and of people, Lord have mercy. Jesus born in poverty, gurgling and crying, and laid in a manger, Christ have mercy. Spirit of love, breath of the universe, flickering, dancing in the candle flame, Lord, have mercy. Christ as a light, illumine and guide us. Christ as a shield, overshadow and hold us. Christ below us, Christ above us, Christ beside us, on our left and our right. Christ as a light. Christ as a shield. Christ be with us on our left and our right. And so we pray. Holy God, you have revealed the glory of your love in Jesus Christ and has given us a share in your Spirit. May we who listen to Christ follow faithfully and in the dark places where you send us reveal the light of your Gospel. Amen. Our first reading is taken from the second book of Kings. A reading from the second book of Kings. Elisha and Elijah set off, and fifty men of the company of prophets also went, and stood at some distance from them, as they both were standing by the Jordan. Then Elijah took off his mantle and rolled it up and struck the water. The water was parted to one side and to the other until the two of them crossed on dry land. When they crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me what I may do for you before I am taken from you. Elisha said, Please let me inherit a double share of your spirit. He responded, You have asked a hard thing. Yet, if you see me as I am being taken from you, it will be granted you. If not, it will not. As they continued walking and talking, a chariot of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them, and Elijah ascended in a whirlwind into heaven. Elisha kept watching and crying out, Father, Father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. But when he could no longer see him, he grasped his own clothes and tore them in two pieces. We now hear the Gospel according to Mark. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. 
And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice, This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Suddenly when they looked round, they saw no one with them any more, but only Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. Here ends the reading. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Transfiguration. If you look up transfigure in the dictionary or thesaurus, you will find a multitude of other impressive alternatives. Transmogrification, metamorphosis, transmutation, permutation, transposition, transanimation, metagenesis, even metasomatosis. But of all the various alternatives and synonyms that we might consider, one of the most powerful is transubstantiation. Together they convey the meaning of total and radical change, of a change in one's very being, a change from the mundane to the extraordinary, from the everyday to the sacred. The Gospel of Mark passage about the Transfiguration starts six days later, rather begging the question, six days later than what? Well, six days later, then Jesus travelling with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi, where he asked them the critical question, Who do you think I am? Some seem to think that he is John the Baptist, reincarnated. Others that he is Elijah the prophet, once more come to earth. But when asked directly and personally, Peter is reported to answer, you are the Messiah. Following this revelation, Jesus then teaches to the people that they are to take up their own crosses. He is quite clear and stark. If any want to follow him, let them renounce their self-centeredness. Those who play it safe will perish. Those who give their lives for him and the gospel will be saved. And it may come to that, and they may well be called to give up their lives, all the things that they hold most dear, in order to be his disciples. Discipleship hurts. It most certainly did then. Discipleship costs. You may have to give up attachment to things previously deemed precious. And so today we hear that Jesus takes three disciples, Peter, John, and James, up a mountain to pray. Later tradition identifies the mountain as Mount Tabor in Lower Galilee, but the Gospels don't say. The three Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke all cover the story, but in rather different ways. Where Matthew and Luke focus on Jesus' face, for Mark, it is his clothes that become startlingly white. Moses and Elijah then appear, the great patriarchs of the Jewish people, perhaps representing the law and the prophets. They also signify the rescuing of the Israelites from slavery to freedom in the form of Moses, while Elijah represents the many times the prophets have called the people to courage and faithfulness. Peter then proposes that the three tents be made, one for Jesus, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. It's a slightly odd thing to propose. Clearly, Peter is struggling to make sense of this, 
and so he tries to understand what is happening on his own terms. He does so in a way that is very understandable, very human, but wrong. We like to form a pattern of the world, a mental map of how things work, why they happen, an explanation of the way the world works and why. We tend to seek explanations for new things according to the old ways. And generally it can serve us well. We learn that if we drop a rock it will fall. So when we drop a stick we can expect it to do the same. Likewise, a bag of feathers and a cup of water. It makes our world feel more constant, more predictable, less random and unstable. It also cuts down on valuable mental processing time. We can assume certain constants and concentrate on what is changing before our eyes. But sometimes it can serve us ill, as we can get overly used to expecting the expected, to anticipate the accustomed. As Jesus says earlier in Mark's Gospel, no one puts new wine into old wineskins, otherwise the wine will burst the skins and the wine is lost, and so are the skins. But one puts new wine into fresh wineskins. In other words, the old skins have stretched all they can. There is no more give, no, no ability to stretch and grow. Peter tries to understand what is happening in old ways. In suggesting the building of three dwellings or booths, he is trying to fit what is happening into his memory of the Feast of Booths or the Feast of Tabernacles, Sukkot. The Feast of Sukkot is intended as a remembrance of the type of fragile dwellings in which, according to the Torah, the Israelites dwelt during their 40 years of travel in the desert after the exodus from slavery in Egypt. It celebrates the abandonment of materialism for higher spiritual values. It also gives thanks for the gathering of the harvest and was also a joyous festival of God's presence among his people wherever they might need to roam. So Peter wants to build some tents to try to fit the strange and the new into the traditional and the familiar, perhaps even to constrain and contain what is happening at least to put it into a place that he understands. And this is where one of the important themes of the encounter emerges. It speaks to us of partial understanding and of partial response, of always trying to tame and domesticate the gospel, to seek to limit its demands upon us and the metanoia, the change of heart and change of life that is in truth, required. We try to put the demands of our faith in a box. A tent will do just as well. To limit the call of Jesus to something that is moderate, manageable, and least inconveniencing. However, what we know of pilgrimage, discipleship and spiritual progression is this. We might liken the journey of faith to a pathway, strewn with distractions and blind byways, but the central path nevertheless does have an abiding sense of direction, that we are called along a track, sustained by the company of others and the inspiration through the courage and compassion of Jesus. Along that road, however, we encounter obstacles, rather like walls across the way, and then we have a choice. The wall is too high to see over and too steep to carry any baggage with us. So then we must decide. The call of our faith tells us that there is growth, wisdom and a remade and renewed self on the other side of the wall. That beyond what we know there is new understanding, 
a strengthened heart, a mind transformed. But we must leave at the base of the wall the assumptions, the expectations and the reassuring, albeit flawed and limiting, convictions that have carried us thus far, that what has comforted and sustained us until now may well be of little value to us over the wall, and yet we cling to them. We believe that so much of our security and identity have been preserved by their possession, that we are loath to give them up, no matter how much they may hold us back. So all too often we settle. We say to ourselves, thus far and no more. Whatever joy and inspiration may lie over the wall, whatever kind of a new creation I might become, I dare not risk the leap of faith. I cannot see the landscape beyond. I fear the uncertainty of that new and unexplored place. The human truth is that we mostly only take the leap when we are pushed, not pulled by the excitement of searching, but pushed by loss and suffering, such that the bereavement of leaving our baggage at the foot of the wall is as nothing compared to the need to leave the pain behind. Peter tried everything he could to control the uncontrollable, to see the new and dazzling through lenses tinted by familiarity and orthodoxy. In the end, perhaps only at the end, he truly accepted that the revolutionary, the transformative, that transfiguration could only be met with acceptance, courage and a journey into the unknown the unforeseeable. May we be prepared to cast off the comforting but ultimately limiting, burdensome detritus and clutter of our lives and to follow Jesus where he would lead us. Amen. We are pilgrims along the way of life. Let us therefore remind ourselves of the path of faith that has brought us to this time and place. We believe in God the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. We believe in God the Son, who lives in our hearts through faith and fills us with his love. We believe in God the Holy Spirit who strengthens us with power from on high. We believe in one God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us now pray for our church, for ourselves and neighbours and for the needs of the whole world. Loving Lord, let your light shine in our lives. Let its brightness fill our hearts and transfigure us. May we be changed into your likeness, sharing your heart of compassion and courage. Christ be with us, around and beside us. May your church seek to transform our darkest places with your light. May we seek out the lost and deprived, the poor and the rejected, and bring them to a place of love and acceptance. We pray for the mission and outreach of your whole church. May it both see your light and be your light. Christ be with us, around us, and beside us. Lord of light, transfigure our cities, towns, and villages. We pray for areas of danger, for places of poverty, strife. May there be hope instead of despair, opportunity and fairness for all. Transfigure our own homes, that they may be places of peace and kindliness, of holiness and hospitality, grace and of goodness. Christ be with us, around and beside us. 
Transfigure our hospitals and nursing homes. We pray for all who are sick or grieving and for those who care for them, medical staff, care workers, and loved ones. We give thanks for all who have departed this life, especially those we have loved and lost, those who in their lives have served as an example to others, those who have left this world a little better than they found it. May they now reside in a greater light upon another shore. Christ be with us, around us, and beside us. We also pray for the peoples of Ukraine, Russia, Palestine, and Israel. We remember them now and hold them in our hearts in a moment of silence. Christ be with us, around and beside us. And now a few moments for our own concerns and prayers for those on our hearts. Together, we say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. May Christ, who draws the nations to himself, teach us to love our enemies. May Christ, who enters the water of baptism, lead us to die to all but love. May Christ, who gives new wine for the world, turn our bitterness into joy. And may the blessing of God the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bringing peace beyond all understanding, be with you and remain with you and all whom you love, now and forever. Amen. Let us go in the peace of Christ. Thanks be to God.